Hi there, and welcome to another interview. Today, I've got the fabulous Eddie with me, and I'm going to ask Eddie the same question I ask absolutely every guest. Hey, Eddie, why did you become carnivore? Yeah, so thanks, Stephen, for having me on the channel. Um, I've seen you around a little bit, but it's actually nice to talk to you face to face. Um, so my story is quite long. Um, again, I'll, I'll try and shorten it a little bit, but of course, I'm not going to sacrifice the the good details or the important ones. So. The thing about my story is, is it's, it's once again quite long. I started whenever I was about, I was around 16 years old. Um, I was just a normal kid like everyone else. Um, and I was going to my third hour chemistry class. Um, and it was directly after my strength training class that I had right in the early morning. And um, that morning was not like, not any different than any other morning. Uh, I was going there and I was quite tired because I had just worked out. Um, and it's very warm in the in the in the classroom, so I, I got very tired even even more so. And I went to put my head down uh, just to relax a little bit. Um, I know, not allowed, but you know, and um I noticed something very, very strange. Um, I felt butterflies in my stomach as if I were nervous, except nothing actually elicited that response from me. And it was very, very strong. It was not a very weak feeling. It wasn't subtle. Um, it came on very quickly as well. And I didn't know what was going on. It just kept creeping up. It just kept, you know, rising. And that elicited more fear from me, which then elicited that response from me even more. It was just this feedback loop. And, you know, how people are whenever they're experiencing fear, their rational brain sort of subsides a little bit. Uh, and so I started to look around the room to see if anyone was experiencing the same feeling, but of course they wouldn't be. It wasn't very rational, but it was just, it was the most immediate response my brain could come up with. Um, and within a matter of seconds, actually, I had a panic attack. I had to leave the classroom. And at the time I, I, I went to the bathroom, uh, just to escape. And, um, the thing was, is at the time, I didn't actually know that that was what a panic attack felt like. I'd never felt one before, so I had to reflect on what happened, and then I came to the conclusion, that must have been what that is. So it's not just some metaphor, it's actually a real thing. So I actually, I, I left school early because I was so confused. Um, I didn't know if it was a fluke or what. Um, I went to, I think it was my dad that picked me up, dropped me off at his house, and um, I just wrote it off as a fluke. Um, so... I thought, well, okay, cool. I get I get the rest of the day off. Uh, except I didn't actually think that um, my life was never going to be the same again. Uh, as dramatic as that sounds, that is absolutely what the truth was. Um, I continued to experience symptoms. Uh, the butterflies in my stomach never subsided. Um, it was always extant. If even even if it existed on a spectrum, whether it was it was subtle or extreme, it was always there. Um, it was worse whenever I stood up, I would have tachycardia and blood pressure swings. So basically symptoms of POTS. Um, and then one of the, I, I obviously, I, I had other symptoms as well, like chronic fatigue, um, that I'd never had before. And the, the most important symptom here to emphasize that I always emphasize because it was the most debilitating symptom was actually a symptom that no one has really heard of before. I think one of the person I've heard of after I've told my story has said that they've dealt with the same thing, but not to the same degree. Whenever I would experience a symptom, or sorry, a uh, a feeling like a sensation, an emotion. Sorry, I couldn't find the word there. Uh, whenever I would experience an emotion, whether it be positive or negative, and whether it be subtle or extreme, um, I would have extreme, excruciating pain. Start from my stomach. That would shoot all the way up into my throat, all the way up into, you know, the underside of my chin and also down into like my legs, <laughs> actually. Um, and it would call it would actually cause me to buckle. I, I would grab my stomach. I would have to sit down um, and I would have to bend over while sitting down. So basically my torso was in between my legs. It was it was very bad. And it was really confusing because, you know, try and tell that to any doctor and, and then have them try and understand that. Of course, when you tell a doctor, which is exactly what happened, I would try, I tried to see the doctor, multiple doctors. I saw a neurologist because I would have muscle uh, and nerve twitching um, that was happening a lot around my rib cage and around just up my upper neck and everything. I saw a neurologist, tried to get a GI scope done or actually 
didn't try. I did get a GI scope done that showed nothing. Neurologist said that I needed to, you know, I just needed to gain some weight because I had some slight neuropathy in my elbow. That was the that was the diagnosis there. And it doesn't help that we lived in a we live in a medical dead zone where I am, anyway. Um, but we went to just my my general care practitioner as well, and we told him my symptoms. And he, of course, if you're going to tell a doctor that every time that you experience um, a, an emotion that you feel pain and you have an, a high heart rate and your blood pressure goes up, what are they going to tell you? They're going to say that you're having anxiety, which is absolutely what what I was told. Um, but they didn't. They told it to me very tacitly, very obliquely, because they didn't explicitly say you you must be having anxiety. They they asked, oh, they they said, oh, that's interesting. Does your family have any history of anxiety disorders? That's how they said it. So I mean, you know, you know that what that means though. And anyway, at the, at the time, nobody was going to help me. I had to take matters in my own hands. But given the fact that I was sixteen years old. Everything that I had been told about taking the, you know, you're not told that your health is in your hands. Um, like, you're not taught that. It's in other people's hands. Um, and if it fails and they can't do anything about it, then you can't do anything about it. Well, I'm not someone to just lie lie down and, and take a being, you know. Um, so I didn't leave matters in my own hands. However, given my complete bereftness of knowledge about health or anything, uh, I didn't really know where to start. So I didn't delve into it immediately and and 24-7 like I have today. It started with me just Googling, you know, simple questions with to no avail. But, you know, I was I thought that I had come down with some sort of like hypocalcemia or something. It was just I was just going down the rabbit hole. And uh, nothing seemed to work, though, whenever I would supplement with the things that they said are the cures to whatever ailments I believe that I had. Nothing would work. So. I was just missing school for weeks on it. I would go maybe I would attend a day or two a week. Um, I would I was split custody between my father and my mother though. So whenever I would go to my mom's, um, I had a stepdad there as well at the time. Um, they were not. They didn't believe me as much. They they did think that it was anxiety, just out of the blue anxiety that I'd never had until I was 16. And it didn't slowly creep up. It was immediately I had a panic attack without knowing what the reason was. And now I'm having excruciating pain that is preventing me from going to school. Well, they still said it was primarily my stepfather that said that it was anxiety um, and that he had dealt with this stuff before. That was a good one. Um, and it was it was all this normal stuff. So I was basically gaslit by my own by parts of my own family my dad was the only one at the time that really knew that that wasn't what was going on because i had never had a history of that and that didn't really make any sense <laughs> um he knew how i fought we got along really really well we talked more than i talked to any other family members so he knew that that must not have been what was going on so he was allowing me to stay home from school it was harder to do that whenever i was with my mom on thursdays and fridays so that was a problem. So yes, I would attend somewhat, but I would not usually be attending at my dad's. I couldn't get up from bed. I couldn't do normal things. I, I would have to keel over and walk to the bathroom to even, you know, enter the bathroom. I couldn't walk normally. So anyway, as this continues, we get to about, it, it keeps getting worse and worse and worse until about um, 2020 when the pandemic started. I didn't have a job because I wouldn't dare try and work with the condition that I had. Whatever was going on. Well, I was basically, I was given an ultimatum. Um, at the time, I was being looked at like I was lazy uh, by many people because I wasn't working, but I was able to laugh and whatever and, and talk to people normally if I was sitting down or keeled over or whatever. So, of course, if that's the case, and also if nothing is externally wrong with me that people can actually perceive, then there must not, nothing must be wrong with me then. That's that's the logic people were, were operating under. So... I was given an ultimatum during the pandemic when everything was shut down. I was told that if I don't get a job, I will have everything taken away from me. Um, is that fair? No, it's not. But that's what I was told. Um, so I applied to many places that were actually still open. So not many places, actually. Uh, but one of the places was Walmart because many of the corporations were still open because people still have to do grocery shopping. And so I was immediately given I, I was um, I was accepted. And. So I started uh, a job at Walmart, but it, a lot of people may think that that's a sinecure. It's, 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 it's just some sort of job that you can just stand there and get paid. Uh, depending on your position there, that is the case. 
Uh, but I got a position in the warehouse aspect of of Walmart, and uh, that's pretty, at least in my from my perspective as someone that is absolutely debilitated it was relentless <laughs> you know you're, you're doing a lot of heavy lifting and i wasn't able to do that of course physically was i able to if i had to well yes and i found that out very quickly uh but it wasn't a, a good idea and so during that time uh I, I it was in april of 2020 i got that job and i worked there for an entire year actually and the entire time that I was there, I was just running myself into the dirt. My symptoms were getting worse. My tachycardia was getting worse. My resting, my homeostatic heart rate standing was probably about around 120 to 130 every single day, 24-7. Now, I'd, I still think to this day, I'm like, uh, is that is the damage that my arteries sustained from that healed? Because I have no idea. But, you know, um, I'm, I hope so. But then I decided I, I, I needed a different job for many reasons, but one of which was I, I can't do all this stuff. So I tried to find an even easier job, um, which Target seemed to be the, the one. So I started working at Target um, and it was easier. Uh, but at that point, the damage had already been done. So I was still continuing to do myself further damage, you know, from even walking around. I could tell my symptoms were getting worse and worse and worse. Now, to take a slight break from this, I will say that right around this time, I started to think, why did it take me this long? I have no idea, but I started to think, well, maybe diet has a role to play in all this. <laughs> maybe, you know, all this stuff is um, being is due to inflammation. Everyone hears the word inflammation, and even back then I had heard it, therefore, but I didn't really, a lot of people don't really know what it actually is. And back then it was the same thing. You hear all, you hear about what inflammation is, but you don't really know what it is. You just hear the word, tattered, you know, thrown around, um, but you know it's a bad thing, right? Uh, and then you hear about all these things that are inflammatory or potentially inflammatory, and it's everything. So, again, didn't really have any anywhere to go. Um, but I did start to, you know, I found one of these coteries and, you know, I was listening to a lot of what they had to say. And I came across uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry after having been sort of more plant based because that's what you're told is healthy for a while um, with, with to no avail. Um, I did come across Stephen Gundry and. That was towards the end of 2021, whenever I was working at Target still. And um, he, of course, if anyone doesn't know who Dr. Gundry is, he's someone that is hyper fixated on lectins in plants. So he he says in his book, or m multiple books of his, that lectins, not all plants are your friends because many plants are full of lectins, which are these plant compounds that engage in molecular mimicry and cause your immune system to go haywire, basically, to simplify. And... Um, I thought, wow, that's actually a really interesting perspective to think that, you know, many of these plants we very haphazardly, very, very cursorily introduce into our diets without having it, without reflecting on the ramifications of them. And I thought it was very enticing to me. So I started immediately cutting out the things that he said to cut out and also introducing some things like high quality animal protein. But he does say to limit that, to be fair. And I saw I saw some pretty good benefits, uh, at least that are, were associated with with, with transitioning to a diet like that. Uh, I was eating a lot of carbohydrates, but primarily in the form of fiber. Uh, so maybe it was the absence of as many carbohydrates as I was eating and also the introduction of animal protein that was high quality and the elimination of many lectin-containing foods. You know, it's hard to isolate one of those variables, but I do know that it was associated with bet with improvement of my symptoms. Uh, not enough, though. I was still debilitated. I did not know what was going on with me. Every time, at this point, every time that I was walking around the store, if I even moved my arm or if I was lying down in bed, if I moved my arm, if I moved my leg, everything was cracking and popping and shifting in my body. If I laughed or something or if I coughed, my ribs, all of them, you know, bilaterally would just thud. No idea what was going on. Everything was, it was just, it was scary, but I was dealing with it for so long that it just became second nature. So sometimes I would try and pin down a, a, a symptom while completely ignoring all of the other 10 symptoms that are surrounding it because I was so used to them. So that was a problem as well. Well, anyway, in January of 2022, everything hit the fan at that point. I was walking down the stairs and I went to use the bathroom and I was walking towards the bathroom and I l turned my head naturally. It wasn't exactly look trying to look for something. It's just it was a I was in an animated motion because I was walking and my vision went black for a good second. Now, that doesn't sound on the surface, you know, a second doesn't sound like a long time. But when you're talking about the loss of your vision at 17 years old, that is a that is a long time. Any loss of vision, black, 
<laughs> you know, is, is a long time. And that, that terrified me. Uh, my stomach dropped, like my heart dropped, my heart sank. And the thing is, is that feeling is butterflies in your stomach, which caused the pain like uh, to, to spread throughout my body. That would happen every time that would happen. And so that, like that debilitated me. It was like, it's like getting punched in the gut every single time that happens. So then I'm still going to the bathroom, but I walk even faster, close the door, shut it, uh, or lock it. And then I'm sitting on, I hit, I hit the floor in the bathroom and I'm just terrified at this point. I call, I call my dad, which was basically to tell him, you know, Hey, can you pick me up from work, uh, after work? Um, because I, his house was my safe place at that point. It was my, my only safe place because he was at the time, the only person that believed I had anything serious going on with me. Um, so he did pick me up. I go and leave for work for two weeks, two week leave. And I thought, okay, I just need two weeks to, you know, recover. Um, little did I know, actually those two weeks, I, I just completely, I eroded over that course of the two weeks because I wasn't engaging in any physical activity. So I became even more loose. Remember I was saying that I just was shifting everywhere and, and popping and all this stuff. So actually the only muscular engagement that I was, well, you know, imposing onto my muscles while working was was completely surceased now because of my leave. So now it se that seems to be why I completely, I wasn't even able to return to work. I never returned to work. I stayed at my dad's the whole time. I wasn't able to get up to go to the bathroom or make my food. I was basically, these were the worst months of my life from, from January to about April. I was staring up at the ceiling 24 seven. I mean, seriously, from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed, if I did go to bed, basically anticipating my death. Um, because I, th I thought that's the only thing that to come next. I was watching, it, it was even worse because I was watching everyone around me live their lives normally, including my friends. I'm, I'm 17 years old at this point, and um, all of my friends are living their lives, like, growing, <laughs> improving. And, you know, I'll get to it later um, if I have time. I, I was growing, too, as well, just in different ways. Um, but it was, it was torture. Um, there was a point where... I was trying to go to sleep and yeah, I, I got so loose and I'll get to what this is in a minute uh, that whenever I was going to sleep at night, your breathing gets more shallow or it gets, it gets slower, uh, it gets more relaxed. And what was happening were, was my ribs were sinking in so much that I would shoot myself awake gasping for air because they would, my diaphragm would spasm. That's what was happening. And so it was to the point where I was up for 40 hours one day um, because every single time that I would try and go to sleep, my body would just wake me up no matter how exhausted I was. I was I was not able to even walk around and uh, I was falling asleep walking around. I was so exhausted. It doesn't help that I was eating primarily vegan at the time um, because of Dr. Gundry. You know, it, it, you got to be careful with the animal protein. Uh, just you know, only get rid of the lectins and stuff. Well, it doesn't help that I was clearly nutrient deprived i was emaciated at this point but we went to the i had i had to be taken to the hospital um and i couldn't walk to the car my my dad had to basically drag me uh, into the into the car he drove me to our local hospital it was luckily it was like a minute away and uh i remember i actually i forgot about this until just now i don't usually say this in the interviews but i was looking at the nurse while they're putting me in the in the uh in the bed well three people are trying to hook things up to me and i said i really do think that i'm gonna die today and i was trying to warn them that that was probably what they were gonna see um and they said ah, i don't really think that's gonna happen to you i said okay well <laughs> and i'm freaking out and uh they they tell me I'm trying to tell them what's going on and i tried to tell them that the chiropractor that i was seeing at that point was actively Whenever he was treating me, there's so many details here. I just like bypass some of them. Um, he, I was getting, I was going to the chiropractor every day, and he was basically cracking me and, and adjusting me. Uh, but one of the adjustments he was doing was actually putting his fingers into my ch my chest up here and pulling my stomach out from my chest cavity back into position. So clear, and I could actually see it happen every time he did it. And clearly, something was going on. Your stomach isn't just supposed to go up under your chest cavity that that far. And I'm trying to tell him that the the head of the ER at night, um, what's going on and what our chiropractor thinks it is. We think it's a neurological issue. We have no idea what's really going on, but you know, it's something crazy. He comes to me later, gets down on his knee next to me and goes, I want you to look at me and I want you to understand that what your chiropractor told you was complete voodoo science 
has no bearing on on reality basically you are dehydrated that was his diagnosis they shot me up with ativan which many people may or may not know what that is it's a benzodiazepine and if you're really 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 tired um then it's supposed to knock you out basically and it is supposed to relax you though it's an anti-anxiety thing that's really that's its primary purpose well i was sent home after being shot up with ativan and electrolytes and all that stuff feeling better sort of uh and then i went to sleep but i still i barely went to sleep even after 40 hours of no sleep and being shot up with ativan and given electrolytes because my ribs were still i was still ga like basically gasping for air eventually i did go to sleep and then here is where I really realized, okay, I need to do like a lot of research here. Like, I mean, because my life is, is really about, like it was about to end and we now know that, but I'll get to that. It was clearly a structural issue and I was focusing way too much on diet at this moment because I'd already tried to fix diet. And we, at this point, you know, with the, with the severity of the shifting of my bones and everything, I was like, diet is not going, this can't, this is too much at this point. If this was related to diet, the damage has been done so much that we need an external intervention that isn't diet to fix it. <laughs> um, so I started looking at structural conditions and I came across um, CCI, craniocervical instability, which is basically characterized as in <laughs> it's 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 a loosening. It's, it's a weakening or yeah, it's a weakening of the ligaments, which are what hold bone to bone in the cervical spine leading up to the cranium, leading up to the skull. And I thought, well, okay, what would that cause? Well, that causes shifting of the bones, and that can cause impingement uh, on the surrounding nerves and arteries in the neck. And, you know, when you're talking about the nerves in the neck, you're talking about really important nerves. You're talking about phrenic nerves that are responsible for controlling the contractions of the diaphragm, hint, hint. We're talking about nerves like the vagus nerves, which regulate your parasympathetic and really it's it's the regulatory nerve of the parasympathetic, the the relaxing, you know, state of the body uh, nervous system. And it's, the vagus is Latin for wandering. And so that should tell you, you know, they, they wander throughout the entire body, all the way throughout your legs um, from the neck. And they control things like digestion. You've got two of them, one on the right side, one on the left side. But if you've got, I mean... All you really have to talk about are your vagus nerves, at least in terms of the, the significance of my condition here. Because if you have enough movement, which enough depends on, you know, it depends on the person uh, as to how much enough is, but it can be even a matter of millimeters um, because you're talking about a very small amount of space between the bone, between the bone and the nerve surrounding the neck. Well, um, that can cause impingement, like I said, which can cause disruption of nervous system regulation but over time if that does not halt um that leads to degeneration of the nerves because they don't have a, a chance to heal up and i thought wow okay this uh, all the symptoms that were that were listed i came across a, a seminar um from a channel by the name of carry medical florida uh, and it was by a doctor by the name of uh, dr ross hauser who owns the he's the founder of the clinic uh, in Fort Myers, Florida, and he was talking about vagopathy. He termed it vagopathy, which is you know a neur it's neuropathy of the vagus nerves. And he was talking about all these symptoms and how it can be related to CCI, uh, and CCI could be the culprit. And I thought immediately, this is exactly what I've got going on. Um, at this point, I was desperate, so I didn't think too much, and I actually scheduled a an appointment with them uh, without telling anyone. I told my dad afterwards, and then he was like, "Yeah, of course." You know, I'm, work, I'm desperate to do anything. He actually went into debt with the medical, you know, with the appointments and everything. Um, so he was he was on board. But I still had to wait until April 6th um, to leave Florida. And then April 8th was my first diagnostic appointment. So I scheduled it in February and I still had to wait this long. And I thought, you know, hopefully I make it that long. Every day I was thinking that. Every, hopefully I actually live this long enough to actually get diagnosed and then treated. And I'll explain what the treatments are in a minute. Well, eventually, we take one 14-hour drive from where we are all the way down to Florida. Fortunately, my maternal grandmother lived an hour and a half away from the clinic, and she still does. Um, we got there in one day, 14-hour drive, on August 6th, or sorry, April 6th. April 8th was my first appointment. We drive there. They do all these diagnostic tests, like a DMX digital motion x-ray. So it's an x-ray, but it's, it's in, in motion, so that you can see basically a, uh, a separating of the ligaments in certain positions, which is really important when you hit, if, if you are to have this condition, because sometimes static x-rays, many times they don't catch the condition because it's just one picture. They did a cone beam CT scan where there's a CT scan that just circles your entire head 
to see the structure of your neck in, in even more detail. A lot of these different tests, they tested heart rate variability. Um, they tested a lot of things. Well, Dr. Hauser comes in, which it was interesting because it was almost like looking at a celebrity because I'd watched his videos for so long on YouTube. Um, he came in and in every single room, every patient room, there's this large TV and he'll show you all of your scans on there and he'll walk you through them. And a lot of times you don't really know what it means too much. Uh, and he knows that. So he actually was telling us all of this and many of the things were going over our head. But he said, well, basically to put this into perspective, um, and he said this word for word, he said, if you had come any later, you were on your way for something catastrophic. And I mean, that is, I wasn't ignorant enough to to not realize that what that actually meant in doctor language. <laughs> you know, he, he meant exactly what it sounds like he meant. And, you know, if anyone has actually been really, really sick, they realize that that is not daunting. That is actually relieving because you finally got a diagnosis after how many years? <laughs> And so I immediately call my mom afterwards and everyone. I'm like, hey, guys, I was right. Something is seriously wrong with me. They looked at basically, yeah, they looked at my neck and they realized that there was, I was in the top 10% of their cases, what they said. And they see, they see tens of thousands, if not at this point, hundreds of thousands of people they've seen and treated. So I immediately began regenerative treatment on, I believe, April 11th. What is this regenerative treatment? Well, uh, many people have heard of it before. It's prolotherapy and PRP, platelet-rich plasma. Many people have actually heard of the latter part of platelet-rich plasma. Um, they're very similar. Prolotherapy just involves um, injecting a solution in between the bones into the ligaments directly, uh, a solution of water, sugar, a plant compound that promotes inflammation because leave it to plants to have a compound that does such a thing, and also I think a slight numbing agent is in there as well. Um, the entire point is to actually promote inflammation of the ligaments. So it's designed to cause the body to repair the ligaments, to make them bigger. It's like going through a second developmental process in my case. Um, and so that is what they would do. PRP is slightly different where they do the exact same thing, but instead what they're doing is they're extracting your blood, spinning it twice to concentrate the healing elements out of it, and then focusing, basically making the, the, um, the solution that instead. So it's a different solution, but they're doing the exact same thing. PRP, in my experience, has been more effective at that. But the entire reason they have to initiate an inflammatory response on the ligaments is because ligaments have very poor blood supply, first of all. They're white and muscles have a very large blood supply. It's one of the reasons why they're red, one of them. Um, and so they don't heal as effectively, um, if at all, depending on the severity of an injury, if you were to come down with an injury. In my case, I don't have an injury. So that was one of the things we're wondering, why is my neck like this? You know, um, So anyway, I, I undergo these treatments. They're not easy. They're not, they can't put you under completely for treatments. All they can do is either give you nitrous to relax you, or they can, they can shoot you up with some Xanax, you know, intravenous Xanax, um, which is very expensive. Insurance does not cover these treatments. Um, at least you know, you have to you have to file a claim yourself and, and basically beg insurance to, to pay for it. Uh, but that's just because it's experimental treatment. And so it is very expensive already. Same thing with the, the drugs that you have the option of taking. I am someone that I've never taken the drugs. I've never taken nitrous in my life. I just said, you know, OK, I'll lie down and take this. Uh, they inject over 100 treatments or 100 injections at once sometimes, depending on the severity of the case. So that was me. I just took all of it at once one go um and it was immediately effective though in terms of the stability i felt in my neck um and a lot of my symptoms were already subsiding until the inflammation dies down because that actually acts as a splint so basically the treatment involves having you have an injection you get immediate intense stability of the area to the point where you actually have some restricted movement and then as the inflammation subsides you go back down in terms of stability, but it's still higher than you were just before, even if it's slightly more. So that's how the treatments work. So it's this whole thing. Um, long story short, I know, long story short, as, as if it's going to be short at all. Um, we did more diagnostic tests, and it turns out that um, it's not just my neck. It's my entire body. Every single ligament is loose. Every single ligament. They could see it on the x-rays. They're very thin ligaments. So that explains why my ribs were thudding and shifting. And it also explains why I was experiencing pain when I felt any emotion, because 
where you feel emotion is right in your thoracic, you know, region. And actually your thoracic spine is where all of your fight or flight nerves are. So if you've got impingement of nerves right there, you're going to have anxiety, uh, w even when it's not indicated to have anxiety. Um, the problem though, was my ribs were sinking in so much that, um, every time that I would have that sensation of, of, of emotion, a lot of people, they feel it in their stomach, but they don't realize that they're actually feeling something physical. Their diaphragm is contracting every time that they feel emotion when they're talking to someone, the severity to which it will contract is dependent on the severity of the emotion, of course. So that's what you feel when your stomach, you know, drops. So you feel that stomach drop or your heart sinks or whatever. That's an actual physical sensation. The problem though, is whenever you feel that your ribs are supposed to remain stable. They're supposed to not move when you do that. Mine were moving all over the place. I was actually able to put my hands in and just grab them and just move them. It was, it's, it's not, it wasn't fun. And I can actually just, you know, to, to take a slight pause here, I can still with three ribs or so do that because my ribs were so severe that even after the amount of treatments I've had, we're getting there obviously, but, um, you know, it's still to that degree. Well, Yes, it, that's what was happening. Every time that my diaphragm would contract, it would move my ribs so much that it would cause those ribs to impinge on those fight or flight nerves and the things, the nerves that regulate heart rate and blood pressure and all that stuff. So I had to lie down and like put my arm under my back whenever I was lying down to stop that from happening as much as possible. So I wasn't even at this point, I wasn't able, I wasn't watching TV. I wasn't really looking at my phone that much because I couldn't because anything that would elicit any emotion from me, I couldn't even look at unless I was lying down. So anyway, I've been getting these treatments over the since April of 2022. I was living in Florida at that point um, with my grandmother. Now, this is when things actually start to shift towards diet. Like, how did I actually even come into the space in the first place? Well, I was still on the Gundry train, even whenever I was undergoing treatment, I was still doing that. And then I was, you know, I'm on social media still looking at all this health stuff, which I thought health science was actually science at this point. So, you know, I'm like following all that stuff. Well, it's not though. But at the point, at this time, I still thought I thought it was. So then I, I start getting inundated. I start getting, I think inundated is probably the wrong word. I, I became more exposed to Dave Asprey. Many people have heard of Dave Asprey in this space who calls himself the father of biohacking. You know, whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But he that's what he calls himself. Um, Dave was at this point, also sort of on the Gundry train with the awareness of lectins, but also oxalic acid. but And also, he emphasized more animal protein. At this point, I thought, well, that's probably a good idea anyway, um, even if Dr. Gundry is right, because I'm undergoing intense treatments that are involving the rebuilding of my st structures of my body. Like, I should probably eat more meat anyway. So I started eating more uh, grass-fed ground beef, you know, pastured eggs. I was probably having four a day and then one pound of beef a day. Of course, draining the fat, making sure to drain the fat, because of course that's the bad stuff. But I was eating, I was eating a lot of carbs and fiber at the time too. I was eating a lot of cassava root. I was having an entire cassava root every single day with like two sweet potatoes every day as well. Avocado a day, you know, had like an onion, I like stir fry all the time with broccoli and my, all my cruciferous vegetables while eating all of the meat. So I guess you could say that's an improvement, but you know, it's, it's not very apparent yet. Then at the time I was already seeing a lot of Paul Saladino and I wrote him off immediately. I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. I mean, first of all, we know that fruit with all the fructose and the sugar, that's toxic. Okay. We're not designed to eat fruit like that. And also let alone all year round. But also I, I was also against all the meat he was eating because of what I had been taught as well. I thought his diet was atrocious. And then I heard more of him talking because at this point, you know, I'm not someone to just write people off just because, you know, like, I mean, I wrote him off in terms of me not wanting to adopt the diet and think that it was silly to do so. However, I still listened to what they had to say, almost going in to laugh at them in a way like, oh, this is this will be great. Let's see what they have to say, except it became more and more enticing to me. It became it, he it, well, again, long story short, uh, if I could even say that at this point, Paul Saladino beguiled me into his diet. Um. And I did it for about a month. And that was the time that was at that point. I It was the only time that after I ate food, I actually became I had the meat sweats, which are, you know, it's not the meat sweats uh, now that now I know, but it's what people colloquially deem the meat sweats, um, meat and fruit. I would eat that. I'd get I'd break into a sweat. My face would be red. My pulse rate and blood pressure would go up. And it was I mean, it it was the only time after every single time, invariably after I ate, that I, I would have that happen. So 
I did that for, once again, I did that for about a month. And then on August 14th of 2022, I'll never forget this because I do remember dates uh, a lot for some reason. Um, I came across Bart K online on YouTube. The reason for that I've now, I now know is because he had just recently restarted his channel. He had deleted all of his videos and he had basically effectively restarted it. And maybe YouTube recognized that because I had never seen him before. And at the time he had a very small follow. I mean, 30,000 subscribers compared to the people I was watching was really small. And I thought it, the, the thumbnail was him critiquing a video of Paul's that I had watched the previous day. So I'm already like, a, I'm a Paul Saladino, you know, fan at this point. So I go, okay, this will be interesting. And it was about Paul talking about the Randall cycle. So I'm listening to Bart talk about this and I could not stand Bart. I was like, I was like, really? This is the guy we're dealing with right now? Like, seriously? Um, and it's just, it, I mean, I could not, I was pausing the video to be like, what are you talking about? Like, what is this guy talking? And then I hear at the, I look at the bottom of the screen and it says physiologist, nutritionist, and then something else. Like he puts his stuff, like his stuff at the bottom of the screen. And I go, is that a joke? Because right now he's not even, he, he's wearing like a robe or something with a, a cup of coffee in his hand. <laughs> and I'm like, that, that can't be, that can't be right. Well, the, the more, yeah, yeah. The, the more I listen to him, the more I'm listening to him, I'm like, okay, so this guy clearly knows at least something because the words he was saying, some of the stuff that he was talking about, the mechanisms, I was going, there's no way that a lay person could understand what he's saying right now because I didn't understand what he was saying. And I, I'd like to think that I knew more about this stuff than like the people that I surrounded myself with because they didn't know what I was saying at the time either. So I'm going, okay. So I eventually I watched the whole video though. And I said, okay, well, this is interesting. Then I watched another one about Thomas DeLauer. I go, okay, this is really, so then I, I remember sending this stuff to my dad, who at this point was listening to everything I had, had to say about diet as well, because he had seen improvement with everything um, at this point. And I said, okay, take a look at this, because this actually, this guy seems to know what he's talking about. And then from that point on, I discovered more about him, and I discovered he had previous lectures that he had moved over to Odyssey or, um, you know, whatever. And I was like, okay, you know, Let's let's watch these. At the point, I'm completely debilitated. I'm just, all the, all I'm doing at this point is just waiting for my next treatment. Yes, I'm living in Florida, my grandma's house, but I'm living in one room, and I'm not able to do anything. I am once again staring up at the ceiling from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed. At this point, not anticipating my death, but I am like bored out of my mind, <laughs> and also I am in more pain than I've ever been in my life because the treatments are not easy and the healing isn't easy. You know, you, things have to get worse before they get better, sort of thing. Well. At this point, I just start studying. I uh, I would watch like what I watched a pH lecture from Bart, um, and I was typing out an entire research paper on this stuff. I was just pausing, writing the papers out, pausing, writing the papers out, and then I'll go to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And then I was looking at other lectures from other people online as well, and doing the same thing. And eventually, I was doing this thing where I was, I was at, putting the superscripts after every sentence, just writing the. I was like, "Here's the citation," and I was sending this to all my friends and family. My friends being people that you know are like 20 years old at this point, 19, 20. They don't care about this stuff at all. They've never like they don't have to care about anything. They're very carefree. Um, but I'm still sending it to them. Like, hey, you should probably look at this. I'm sending them to my family. I'm talking to my family about it, and I'm like, dude, you, you should probably look at this. And I do this for months and months and months until eventually, I'm talking to one of my friends who's now my girlfriend at this point. You know, it's funny how everything comes full circle. Uh, she she goes she. I was laughing. I was like, I could probably write a book with all the stuff that I have. Like, I could probably write a book with all the information I have. And she laughs, and I laugh too because I was joking. But, you know, I thought it was funny because I, I, in my brain, the way I think, it's almost like I take everything as a challenge now, especially at this point in my life. I took everything as a challenge because I faced the biggest challenge that I've ever faced in my life. I was like, you know what? We're laughing about it. Hold on a minute. And I, that night, went into my grandma's office and I went to her extremely old iMac like the really thick, you know, monitor and everything like that. And I opened the really antiquated, like word style document that they have. And I wrote my prologue to my book, Contraindicated, that I have out today. Um, and um, I wrote it that night. And actually, if people have read my book or are deciding to read my book, when or if they already have read the prologue, that is very, 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 it's basically identical to the prologue I wrote that night. I wrote it in one night and then I sent a picture to her and I said, look, and she goes, oh my God, you're actually writing a book right now. I said, yeah, I'll do it because I, I had all the citations put together. I, I learned it all from a 
professor emeritus that knows this stuff. I was like, you know what? Even if I put in, even if I have to put in the book, even just for my own moral reasons, like this is not all, this is not my information. I have just aggregated the information. Here it is in one compendium. I will do that. I just need to get the message out there because of everything that I've learned. So yes, even though my condition wasn't directly related to diet per se, and we can talk about that later as to why maybe it actually is. Um, it brought me into the health space, which got me to learn about diet. And then here I, I mean, here I am. So I wrote the book and then I started watching Bart religiously because I thought, wow, this is the person like I, I don't care about the religious tribes. I don't care about or, so, the, uh, the, the, uh, food religion tribes, basically the, the, all these tribal areas of, of food and all this stuff and diet. I just care about objective truth. And that seemed to be the Bart seemed to be the purveyor of that at the time that I could actually see. And so I watched him all the time and I liked his abrasive, no nonsense nature because all you see in the health space is nonsense and a bunch of glib rhetoric and all this. And I just didn't like it. So I, I eventually, my grandma asked me, she goes, what are you watching? And she, I go, you won't like him. Like you won't like what he has to say. And she goes, no, 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 turn it up, put it on the TV. So I put him on the TV and I'm cringing before he even starts talking. And she's, she loves it. She's laughing. She likes it. And I'm like, oh, really? Okay. And She's completely turning her ideas around about diet and all that stuff. But but the more she watches, she goes, you know, Eddie, I hear you talk about this stuff a lot. You could probably do exactly what he does. And I said, no, I couldn't. Like to, to do something extemporaneously, like impromptu like that with the limited knowledge I have, like, no, there's no way. She goes, well, you don't have limited knowledge, first of all, but also every time you talk to me, it's extemporaneous. Like every time you talk to me about this stuff, it's extemporaneous. So I am like, okay, I mean, I, I really hope that you're not like just being overly unctuous and just blowing smoke on my ass, right? Well, I go to my room that night or one of those nights and I talk to my dad about it, who's also like the no nonsense person. And I said, I was expecting him to be like, yeah, no, don't let. Well, I said that to him and he goes, oh yeah, she's totally right. You absolutely could do that. And he says, he goes, you know what? I actually have so much faith that you actually could do that. With everything that you've learned now, and you've put a book together, I will put down two thousand dollars to invest in equipment for you to actually start making those videos. And I said, he said, he said, it's a business investment. I will. I mean, even if it takes ten years, I'd like to have the two thousand dollars paid back. I've gone into debt, you know, paying for your medical bills and all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Um, and he goes, but I will do that. And I said, okay. So he starts buying everything, everything that you see around me, except I bought, I bought this green screen thing, but the lights that are used on me right now, the desk that I'm sitting at, all of it was paid for by him. And I said, okay, well, whenever I get back from Florida, I'll start, I'll start practicing. For, so for six months, I wanted to perfect it before I started uploading videos. For six months, I was practicing my video uploading, my video editing, I was trying to find the best program, trying to find the best approach in front of the camera. So I made a bunch of demo videos and many of those are uploaded on my Patreon now today. They're under the antiquated video section. Um, and then finally, January 20th, I actually put out my first public video. Um, and ever since then, I've been basically, you know, building this brand while simultaneously studying free college courses online, uh, for, with biochemistry. I've already finished that completely. So basically my learning process was I would look at a lesson of biochemistry. I'd spend five hours on the lesson typing out an entire paper on it, just like I was doing with the other lessons from Bart, for example. And then I would revise and revise and revise again and revise again. And then I would read the whole thing over and then I would try to teach it to someone. I would basically be talking to myself, but as if I was talking to someone else, trying to teach it to make sure they understood it. And I did that for every lesson. So let alone typing a research paper for every chapter, it was for every single lesson. And then I reread the whole lesson from from beginning to end after I was completely done. I'm going to do that with, I'm doing that with cellular biology now. And then I've been, I, I sort of, I'm not as orderly now. I'm, I'm looking at, I have a textbook next to me. I'm looking at different things all in different orders, but um, I have been simultaneously teaching myself things uh, while also getting this stuff vetted by Bart. I told myself, you know what, you know, what would be funny uh, is if I actually met Bart and I talked to him because I, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I, in my head, I'm idolizing him. It, for being an objective person and for being someone that is actually actually like a professor that is trying to get rid of the nonsense. And I was like, I want to do that. Like, I want to be able to do that. So I was like, you know, it'd be funny as if I actually start talking to him. And at this point, since I'd gone through so many challenges, I am, I now, my whole brain shifted to dreaming big. Like I'm someone that dreams huge uh, because what else am I going to do in life? I just came to that revelation whenever I was like almost dead every day and anticipating my death. Think Your brain, the way you think changes. So I said, I'm going to do it. And, and, you know, my friends were like, okay, 
you know, and I was like, okay, you know, that they, I like that attitude because that gives me more motivation. And guess what? I've already, I mean, I've done a video with Bart. That's crazy. That's just cra like my previous self would have been like, that's, that's insane. So I do have conversations with him to actually, you know, further my understanding. It's more so me getting things vetted that I've learned from classes because he taught those things himself. So I get, you know, finishing touches, you know, and then I also do ask him things that I don't fully understand. And um, that has been my process this whole time up to this this point in having this conversation. That is my story. I'm still undergoing treatments, but travel fees are not cheap, especially in today's economy. So it's been months since I've gotten a, a uh, treatment. I am now able to work out though. I'm like, you know, and, and ever since taking, and this is not a plug, this is just my, just my anecdote. Ever since taking all of the Cerule products, I've actually, that was what started to get me uh, able to start working out again after about a week or two of taking them, all of them at once, to be fair. I've been able to work out. I've built about 11 pounds of muscle already within a pretty short time span with working out once a week. Um, I'm able to walk around the stores now with my girlfriend if we have to buy anything. You know, I'm actually able to go outside and 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 enjoy life. Uh, but I am not to the point where I can even hold a stable job still, uh, like that involves walking regularly or in any physical activity. I have to lay low still. So this is my job. And the ultimate goal is to raise enough money with all of the things that I'm, all the passive income that I'm, that I have w with this channel uh, to move down to Florida so I can actually have treatments more regularly. Um, and so far it's, I, I have high hopes for that. Um, but we'll see where things take me, but I think that's about everything. I really think that's about everything. So Eddie, I think, I think that was amazing. And, uh, <laughs> you were very time pressured just to let people know, Eddie normally speaks for a bit longer and, uh, I was time pressured after coming back from the carnival conference yesterday. And that was, that was stunning. And as I said to you, Eddie, before we started, I always do a part two when, when we haven't got enough time. And I really want to do a part two. If you'd like to do a part two to this, I would absolutely love it and do it sort of ASAP. What do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. That's, yeah, there, I've got tons of questions and I'm dying to ask. So I'm going to save those, even though I'd love to ask them straight after we get off, go off here. Um, but just everybody listening, I hope you enjoyed that. And we will be back with another success story shortly.